from ABC News Radio, KMET 1490 in Southern California. This is Biz Ninja Entrepreneur Radio with your host, Tyler Jorgensen. Welcome out to Biz Ninja Entrepreneur Radio. I am your host, Tyler Jorgensen, and today, uh, for those of you that are not tuning in over the radio, but that are catching this on video, I'm going to show you this amazing thing that I, I got in the mail. And it's, uh, it's a book called One Week Author. And the author of this book is Dana Derricks, who is our guest today. Welcome out to the show, Dana. Hey, thank you so much for having me, man. Dude, it is always, always good to catch up with you. I think what I'm really excited about this time is uh, whenever I connect with you, there's something big and new and exciting in your life. Last time you were really getting massive momentum around the Dream 100 and Dream 100 movement as kind of your flag that you were waving pun absolutely intended. Uh, and today, you're really disrupting the publishing world with uh, One Week Author. So why don't you first just tell us what is the concept? Of, what is One Week Author, the book? And what's it, you know, it's a long book, right? So like, what's it about? What's going on? Yeah, thank you, man. Well, um, so speaking of that, like uh, disrupting, if I, for the record, if I get assassinated, it was probably the publishing industry. So um, I just want that to be known, everybody. Um, no, but, uh, so, uh, basically the backstory on the book is, um, I've written like 13 books prior to this one. And I came to realize that writing a book is not as difficult as the narrative that the publishing industry puts out. It really isn't, it isn't easy, but there's a systematic way and it's like, like a, a way to go about it. That's not awfully difficult. And uh, 14 times in, I, I kind of made a challenge to myself that I'm going to write a book in a week to prove this. And if I don't, my um, punishment was I would have to spend a night in my goat pen with them. <laughs> Thankfully, I got Man, it done. I thought you slept there every Saturday anyways, just to stay connected. Yeah, that's but. true. I, but, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't knock so, it until you try it, everybody. Yeah, so the, the, the premise of it, right, is writing a book doesn't have to be hard, right? And that you have a system for it. You've, you've realized this after writing 14 books that, man, I can make this, I can put this in a process, right? That people can actually make it happen. Let's, before we go into that, cause we will, why should someone write a book? Oh man, there's a lot of reasons. So right now it's it, it, for a person that's going to be in business and specifically for marketing, it's hard to get noticed it's getting harder and harder every day. People are putting out more content every day. People are launching more videos, more ads, more everything every day, emails, you name it. What's happening in books is uh, books, fortunately, are not as like content rich or as valuable as a lot of the other content that we can get our hands on. And so it's easier to compete and win within a book, I think, than it is in a lot of other places. Um, and it's kind of like more of a long lasting thing. It's almost like a generational thing. So if you think about it this way, um, I like doing things that don't get slapped by the next algorithm or the next change. Right. So like if you put a post up on Instagram, I think the shelf life's like five minutes right now that didn't take you that long to put a post out, but if you add it all up and you do a year's worth of posting, it's a lot of time you spent for five minutes. Whereas if you write a book, some of the books that like for me, like ultimate sales machine, like that, that Chet Holmes book, like that's that fed him for a lifetime. And now it's feeding his daughter in their The company lives on because uh, in a major way, because of that book. And I think to myself, like, geez, that's like, carving that's like the most solid foundation you can create so why wouldn't you want to you know leverage that and and have some lasting legacy so for permanence right you this the ability to last beyond the time and it's it's a similar thing i hear to people that say well i'm putting more energy into youtube videos or those kind of things that may not get the initial pop that other types of content get but it, it lasts right it, it can be found for years now books are even more permanent than that. They can be, you know, eBooks and you can be purchased. What is the, uh, what is the appeal? Why do you think, so there's a lot of people that I'll hear, I'll hear, you know, they hear an amazing story and they're like, oh man, you should put that into a book or you should write a book. What is it that makes books so different how we consume them than other mediums? So 
books are one of the only places right now that are relatively distraction free. So if you're reading an email, you're getting distracted by whatever else is going on on your computer screen or your phone. If you're on Facebook, you're obviously getting bombarded by 17 other things or whatever social network. So first of all, it's like you and the book. That, right. And and I think books inherently are things that people like to go and escape from all the other stuff to get into the book, right? So um, for me, when I'm at the gym, like I'm zoned into the, the, the book, like it's me in the book. So it's a really intimate, awesome you know, spot to be with the author without the author having to, you know, actually be there. Um, and then you're spending more time with the author inside of the book than most other places. Cause you can listen to, um, a 30 minute or a 10 minute podcast, or, you know, you can watch a video or you can follow someone on Twitter. But at the end of the day, like you don't get that off, like really holistic beginning to end sort of conversation and life lesson that you would, um, within the pages of a book. So I was waiting for the like reading rainbow theme song to queue up. I don't know if you remember that show with, Oh yeah. Come on. Okay. Thank you. Oh yeah. yeah Cause it was like, I was just like, I was waiting for it. So we're gonna have to put that in here, but, um, <laughs> it, I, I love that. So distraction free and more time. So more, uh, and really it become, what's funny is you would think that a multimedia type of thing, like a video or something would, would be, have a greater intimacy, but books allow for this really fascinating thing where the brain connects at a different level and it, and it connects dots that may not exist and fills it in with their own experience. So books create this connection that becomes very personal, very intimate. And I love that it, like what you said, distraction free, you're not seeing, you know, when you're on page seven, right, there's not a notification popping up saying, Hey, but check out this ad, you know, or go or, or look at this, or your friend just commented on somebody else's post, right? You're, you're there and in the moment. Um, so, those are all great things and all good reasons. And I love the permanence. I love everything else you said, but like why, who should write books? Like who should do this? So everybody should write a book just for their legacy and their family and to pass on whatever skills they have acquired and accumulated in their lifetime for next generations and for their legacy. But um, specifically where I have kind of carved my place in the market is I help nonfiction authors, specifically business owners um, uh, or marketers to market their other products and services with a book because uh, I have not found a better selling tool, including salespeople, including myself selling uh, than a book. And I'll give a quick story of how I figured that out and, and what I've adopted in my own business because of it. So uh, I was reading uh, a, a book from Dan Kennedy and I stumbled across a nugget. Yeah, Dan, right? And I stumbled across a nugget where he kind of let it slip like that In later in his career, he wouldn't entertain a discussion with a p potential client um, about a copywriting project unless they had read a book of his and they could recite, you know, prove it. And I thought to myself, wow, that's really smart. Why? Because that's doing the heavy lifting of the selling. And so I'm yeah. like, what? Well, I should probably try that. So, yeah. so I, <laughs> I did. So I basically forced people to prove that they've read at least a book of mine before they can get on the phone with any of our salespeople to talk about, inquire about any of our services, any of our courses, products, you name it. And ever since, it's like a match made in heaven. The dynamic is totally Big switched. Time. Yeah, like they're yeah. sold before they get on the phone. They're less price resistant. It, it It's the best selling tool I think anybody could could plug into their existing business. It's so, you know, an example of that, that is through secondary benefit. Um, you know, we run an e-commerce marketing agency and I have found that clients who have already read some of Russell's stuff, right? If they've read, uh, like dot com secrets and expert secrets, then the likelihood of them being successful is easily 10 times more. And the likelihood of them being at least a good client is a hundred times more because we can speak the same language. I can, we can speak in frameworks. Right. But here's the important thing. Like, I feel like I need to quote some stuff from the Golden River from Dana Derricks and Dave Lindenbaum. But oh, I have a few of your books. I have so I now have I think three. I have uh, you know your Dream One Hundred book, The Golden River, which is very exclusive. I think the price point on this one is twenty five thousand uh, dollars. Yeah, but we didn't go with the giant price point. I noticed on uh, on One Week Author. What was <laughs> yeah. the pricing strategy on this new launch? Yeah, so um, this one was a little different. It's kind of a lost leader for us. We want lots and lots of people coming into our world. We want to help a lot of authors out. We want to really cut into and undercut the publishing industry uh, because I think that um, 
this process is better and I don't need to, you know, I'm not even in that space. So um, it's just my system I created. Here it is. Yeah. Like, so I don't really need to make money off of it. So, yeah. So what is, what is the value ladder then um, with one week author? Like, where are you hoping they go? Like once someone reads this and, and applies it and goes and does what they need to do to uh, get your book ready to be written, edited, designed, printed, and fulfilled without guessing or wasting money. Once they do that, what, how else does Dana help them? Yeah. So pretty much everything they have or they need is in that book. So they, you know, if you're the DIY go-getter, great, go get your book done. I've got plenty of people that are doing that right now ever since the book launched and it's amazing. Um, otherwise there's a kind of a fast forward option where um, within the confines of a book, it's kind of almost impossible to get every resource you need in order to get your entire book done, including like the, um, you know, the design, the formatting, the uh, template, the um, the uh, printing, the fulfillment, like all of that, it's always changing. And it's always, we're always improving it. So um, we've got an author challenge that is comparable to a probably $40,000 publishing deal um, where it puts the power back in your hands as the author, it shows you everything you need to do um, for like, I don't know, 2% of that cost. Um, but that, I mean, like I said, you can figure it out on your own or we just kind of compile all the resources right there inside the author challenge for you. Awesome. Um, and that would be, so the author challenge kind of makes it, you know, you're still doing it yourself, but a lot more guidance, a lot more direction, you know, help you get over the finish line. Exactly. Yep. Very cool. Um, so tell me what's going on in the world of Dana Derrick's. Like, what did, what are you, what are you building? What are you creating? You know, you, we had you on the show, I think it was almost two years ago talking about mm, dream 100. Too long. Yeah. yeah. Like what's, uh, what's evolved since then? What have you learned? Oh man, a lot. So, uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I've really tried to kind of focus down on um, one value ladder. I know you talked about that and your audience probably is well familiar. So like, um, so you guys can kind of see the bigger picture of what, what I have going on is um, the dream 100. Um, if you haven't, if you're, if that's unfamiliar or whatever, or you want to get a refresher, go listen to that episode we did a couple years ago. It's all still very relevant. Like I said, I like to make, do things that don't get slapped by algorithms. So, um, yeah. but what I've come to realize is I've kind of squeezed a sponge. So the Dream 100 is kind of almost like a subculture where it's like you either know it or you don't. And and those that know, know, you know, when you know, you know, kind of say, thing. So yep. we've squeezed that sponge really, really hard. And I think we've captured a lot of the market. Um, so what we're now doing is we're creating more offers for the front end of that to bring more people in from other markets. Um, so that's why I launched, partly why I launched this. I had kind of a, I don't know, a, a personal, um, uh, I don't know if it's a, a personal agenda to help fellow authors, but um, it also brings people that are business owners that want to, you know, launch a book. They get their book done, and then what's next? Well, I need to market the book. Okay, well, come into the Dream 100 side of our business. Um, right. So it's another lane for people to be brought in and to be exposed to the rest of our world and fresh eyes. So, I love that. What was one of the biggest challenges that you've had to face in like the last year? Oh man. Uh, so, all right. So, kind of two things. First, um, we really reduced our we we started running a lot more lean at like the end of 2019, which like divine, thank goodness we did because then this pandemic thing happened. Um, right. And so thankfully um, we had already kind of reduced what we needed to do, but we were also hit with um, about 50% of our revenue. I, I didn't realize this until it happened, but 50% of our revenue was from live events and, um, and we decided to not pivot into virtual events uh, because we didn't think we could get the same experience across. We're kind of a high end, you know, very limited mastermind style um, events that we host. And there, there's a lot that happens as you right. know. Yep. <laughs> um, so we didn't think we could emulate that experience. So we kind of doubled down, had to pivot back into other things. Um, we went further into our agency in the past year, um, got our revenue in the agency side double, probably triple now um, to kind of make up for the rest. But um, COVID was not easy for us. I don't like making excuses. Like I I started out my business during the recession and I was like, why is no one buying my like logos? Like, you know, like what's going on? And I just thought business was really hard, but I realized I was like in the midst of a recession selling a complete 
completely useless thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, it, it, it made us a lot better. So I'm grateful for it. Awesome. And so, you know, usually the second half of the question is how do you, how did you handle it or how did you overcome it? But you did, you, you, you stayed lean, you made those adjustments, which you totally addressed. Um, what do you see, what do you see coming? You know, we're here in end of 2020, right? We're going into 2021 talking about being algorithm proof or right. Like what's going to be a strong permanent, like what's something that someone needs to be doing now, but what's going to be working for businesses in 2021? I'm calling it direct mail is coming back. Direct response letters, sales letters are coming back. I th- I think uh, advertisers are getting squeezed out. Um, I think you know a lot of the hot ad networks kind of cashed out on the election, and now they've kind of um, got the big fishes they want. And now us little guys are going to hit the road, find the next thing. So I I predict that's going to be big. I also predict uh, that the days of the big box marketing firms and doing like, 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 I don't know, just like posting like pictures and, and like that kind of thing just to post and uh, show how many engagements and likes you get. I think those are going to start going out the window. Cause I think your medium size, small, small size companies are going to get smarter. They're going to recognize data and like the need for it and the need for ROI based marketing, as opposed to just, Hey, let's just get as much traffic as possible or eyeballs. And I think everyone's going to have to get smarter and leaner. And I don't know what the economy is going to do as a whole, but I think businesses are going to have to tighten up. Um, it's an opportunity for all of us. If, if you're out there in you know e-commerce people, we are lucky. If you have to switch into a different niche or tweak something or whatever, do it now if if it feels like you need to do it. Um, and uh, just double down on what you're doing. And I think those, those things are going to hit and take, take, take off. And if you can get a piece of it, go for it. Yeah. I think it, what's really interesting when I first got into e-commerce and started selling online, I, I didn't know where to go to like network. So I went to all the direct response uh, shows. So like most of my connections and most of the early network that I built were all infomercial guys, right? And, uh, and direct and response mail and stuff. And so what I think is interesting is they lagged, they, they didn't adapt fast, right? They really stuck in their ways. But I think what we have now as an advantage going into 2021 is this ability to say, okay, what did I learn from Facebook? And what did I learned from these type of ads? Well, I learned audiences and I learned hyper segmenting and I learned like data tracking and that can all be now applied back to doing direct mail so much smarter and uh and and really being able to do it's yeah the, it takes longer right you have to print you have to mail you have to if it has to be received it has to all of that stuff the the cycle time is longer but the mm-hmm. data i think we can start tracking faster again absolutely um, so i think and that's really dream 100 type stuff like how do i get really narrow in my niche and dominate there instead of just trying to go mass market and don't you know go in and buy in a super bowl ad or something hoping to yeah. that makes me win <laughs> shotgun blast yeah so yeah. what do you think about this like when i was in so when i first started like in ecom over a decade ago but especially like when i got serious about it and like got into the amazon game and all that um 7 ish years ago it was like back then it was like every person for themselves and people like, like you were saying, like networking, probably why you were networking with direct response people is because the econ people didn't network. Cause it was like, you're all against each other. And like, if you shared a like secret or something pretty soon, everybody ripped it off. And it was like, it, it was like awful. So do you think though, now that more and more of the little guys and little gals are getting squeezed out because of all this stuff. Do you think that in 2021 or beyond or even happening now, do you think there's going to be more of a collaboration and more of like, how can I work with that person or how can we help each other? Or how do you see that playing out? So I think there will always be the people that have the scarcity mindset that are too, too shared, uh, too scared to share, right? They're like, and look, I've, I've shared before and had my entire business ripped off and the person did way like better. And, and, but I, I am always, the general rule that I have is that's such a small percentage of the time where that happens, where the opportunity to like be open and share and and collaborate is 10 to one in, from the risk versus reward, right? Like, so I, I think that we are seeing a abundance mindset permeate the entrepreneur space at a greater level than we have in years, 
Like there's just more mindfulness. There's more consciousness in entrepreneurship than there has been in decades. And I think at least in my experience of, of two decades of entrepreneurship, right? Like of, you know, full time. And I think, so what I'm seeing is that that abundance mindset is, is in the e-commerce and in the marketing space is encouraging people to share in ways where they wouldn't have before because they realize like none of us are keeping up with Bezos, right? Like, so this pie, is, we're not competing over a finite piece of pie. The pie itself is growing exponentially. And so like, even if you had 10% day, you know, today, next week, you're at 5% just because the mm -hmm. pie is growing. So if you can share faster, like, again, unless you are trying to compete at a Coke versus Pepsi level, right? Yeah. If you're that cool, keep your cards to your chest. If you're a, a small person operating out of your house, trying to get your first million in revenue or your first 10 million in revenue, share and collaborate and grow faster. That's, that's my spirit. And that's what I think. I think we're seeing more people do that too. Amen. I think the adage, um, faster alone, further together, is probably how I would suggest everybody should be playing this one. Yeah. And, you know, there are obviously things where you may not like, okay, like if it's a direct competitor or something that you may not make sense to do a joint venture with, mm -hmm. but to just talk about what's working Nobody is nobody is is so efficient in their marketing that there's not room for someone else. Nobody. Exactly. Like even at the highest levels, there's not only one using the the example a minute ago, there's not just one Super Bowl commercial. Right? There's like four beer company commercials, like you know what I mean, and three insurance company commercials. It's not like there's just one. So right. and uh, and if you do a good job, you actually accelerate the growth of that pie. And both of you can actually yield greater nets. But, you know, I, that's just my mentality. And I do see more people being like that. I did see it in the early days e-commerce. It was very hush-hush, not even wanting to share what tools they used, even though they were public tools. But now with the, I think part of it's also the ability to see what other people are using, just to examine their code, Facebook yeah. libraries being public. Like can't hide you so can't much. really hide that much. So yeah. you might as well share and go faster. Right. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Totally. But yeah, man. Uh, what, so are, are you stoked? Are you happy with how one week author turned out? I am. Uh, so believe it or not, writing a book in a week is pretty hard. <laughs> like, yeah, um, I believe it. I figured I could do it. I don't think that's something people doubt. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Fair. Fair. I, well, what they doubt is that, is this real? That's what they doubt. Right. Yeah. Um, so to, so th this, I'll tell you like the, the two kind of secret nuggets and you guys should really read this. If for nothing else, just appreciate the irony of who wrote the forward. Howard Berg is the world's fastest reader. He's, you've seen him on Oprah. He's the guy that's like, his fingers like burning through the book and somehow he's like consuming it and it's yep. amazing. But, um, which is funny because I think it probably took him like two minutes to read my, this book and he's probably was like, ah, that was lame. <laughs> but um, <laughs> it's like a little. Well, kid's he he wrote the uh, forward. Unless the entire forward is this was lame. I think it was probably <laughs> <laughs> no. Howard is awesome. He he yeah. really, he inspired me in a major way to write this. So um, anyway, the two kind of secret sauces you you do need to read this, but um, it's it's two parts. First is you're not going to write a book in a week if you don't know the subject matter at an expert level. Okay, so if you've put your ten thousand hours in and whatever it is, it should be oozing out of you. Okay, so that's what the majority of the time is on a book. So when you hear people saying, oh, you need to research for like a year. Okay, that's if you're going to write it from scratch and you don't know much about the subject. But if you're an expert in your field or if you're an expert in a skill, you should be able to knock out a book because all in your head is just getting it out appropriately, right? So that's the first secret sauce. The second secret sauce. Is it all right for me to reveal the secret sauces here? I'm okay, okay with that. All right, all right. As long as you are. So um, second secret sauce, um, and this is, was was really weird for me. Quick backstory on how I discovered it. So... I'm a writer by trade. Um, I've written a lot in my career. I've made millions of dollars for myself and lots more for clients. And so um, I don't like to fly. It's not my thing. Uh, so I had a um, pretty big meeting in Boise, Idaho, which is 36 hours one way uh, in a vehicle, in a car or a truck um, from Wisconsin where I live. So I hired a driver. I'm like, let's go. And uh, so I uh, got in the truck. I'm like, how do I justify 36 hours one way? I said, okay, I've got my book outline, my next book. I'm going to write it in the truck and this is going to be awesome. And then two hours later, I'm closing my laptop because I'm sick as a dog, getting car sick. Then 
30 minutes later, I get into like South Dakota, start losing cell signal. So now I'm in a truck with a driver that uh, is a retired school bus driver that I have nothing in common with and doesn't know why I'm going to Boise of all places. He's like, what is there a rodeo out there? Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so um, I'm like, all right, I got to be able to do something. I can't go on my phone. I can't go on my computer. I can talk. I've been talking about the Packers with this guy for an hour. So um, I decide, well, why don't I just, I've got the outline. Why don't I just read my book into my phone? So I like, like talk it into my phone. So I did. So I went through the outline and I, six hours later, I look over, I'm like, oh my God, I'm done. My book is done. Like the content's all done. And so um, that is like the fastest way to write a book. That's how you write a book in a week. And the reason for it is it's because the average person can type only like 80 words a minute, but they can speak like 160 or twice that many. So um, not only can you write books, way faster by talking. You can also produce content like we are right now, way faster, way more efficient um, by talking. And even more so for any of you out there that have tried to write a book or have written a book before, when you sit down at a computer screen, it, you're not typing at 80 words a minute. You're typing at probably 20 at, at, at most. Why? To write your book? Because you're taking the place of editor while you're typing. Because your natural tendency is not to make a typo. It's to go back and fix it or like, oh, I didn't like that. So then you delete it versus when you get into a groove and you're just spewing like content out of your mouth, it's on, you're unstoppable. So those so, are the secrets. So I think, and that secret sauce like reveals something that's really important. I think perfectionism stops so many people from creating amazing things. And when you're writing, you, you totally nailed it. Like you don't just type and just keep going. Like when we speak, if we stutter or make a mistake, you just move on. You don't you can't go backwards. But when we're typing, we think we have to be perfect. So we stop ourselves, go back, lose our train of thought, forget, then try to build momentum again. So is, you know, and I mean, again, we're going into details if you don't want to say anything, but is your thing like, just get it out there and then let the editor clean it up? Yeah. And so it, get it out there for sure. And, and it, we don't want it perfect. We just want it out, out of your brain. Yeah. Cause that's where most people's books are trapped. Right. Um, and then once it's out, it's so much easier to just clean up after the fact you move stuff, you can do all that. Um, and Got actually it. in the book, I get into more depths on, on this is I don't, I don't really think an editor is, is, is necessary. So awesome. It, or a ghostwriter. And I talk a little bit more about why that is in the book, but, um, I'll have to let you see that one for yourself. Yeah, no, everyone should check that out. And so um, I'm going to, if you're a place where you can click a link, I'll put, it, I'll put the link. It's tyler.pro slash one week author. Otherwise you can type that in yourself. We believe in you. Uh, tyler.pro slash one week author. We can learn more about the book. Dana, what is one item on your personal bucket list? No matter what you're going to accomplish in the next 12 months. Oh uh, man, that is... A great question. Personal bucket list, next 12 months. It's not flying somewhere. Clearly, that's... <laughs> nope. um, where, I need... where are you hiring the bus driver to next? <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is embarrassing, but I need to go on a honeymoon. I haven't gone on our honeymoon yet. We've been married for like two years, but we had a lot of craziness going on while we were getting married. So, Yeah, you got to make okay, that happen. If you're listening, we're going. It's happening. 12 months, the <laughs> clock starts now. Did you go uh, on one? Where'd you go? Yeah, we went to Hawaii. Awesome. Awesome. What do you recommend on there? Man, there's a lot of different ways to go with Hawaii. It, it depends on the person. So like we we actually really like Waikiki because nightlife, you can go out and grab a great dinner. Everything's close, but you can still have a great beach. But some people really like the more remote islands and the more private stuff. So it just that really sounds, it's, Waikiki sounds pretty good, I think. Yeah, we like it. We like being able to, you know, have dinner at a nice restaurant and then still spend the day on the beach. You know? Absolutely. And then, you know, when you're, you know, if you ever end up going with the kids, right, it's also nice to be able to run right across the street and grab stuff instead of having to like, oh, crap, we forgot something. And But yeah, we love it there. But awesome. uh, missing travel a lot right now. Well, um, Dana, we're wrapping up here. Really appreciate it. Uh, everyone, please check out Dana Derricks. He's got, you know, crazy links all over the place. Uh, jumping off point for now, go to tyler.pro slash one week author uh, and learn more about him and appreciate you being on the show. All my biz ninjas, wherever you are listening, just remember it's your turn to go out and do something. Thank you for listening to Biz Ninja Entrepreneur Radio with Tyler Jorgensen. 
please make sure to subscribe so you're first to hear new interviews and episodes. If you found this podcast to be valuable, please share it with a friend. Don't forget to visit our online dojo at bizninja.com to claim your reward for listening to the show.